to welcome all of you to the next talk of what moves you our now monthly photo talk um, that we started in the spring um, and I want to welcome uh, Leslie Deschler Canossi who is the moderator today and I want to welcome Samantha Box who will present her work today uh, Leslie and I met at ICP, at the International Center of Photography, where we are both on the faculty. And Leslie also teaches for Strudel Media Life. She has taught several classes already, which is exciting. Um, Leslie is a photographer, educator, and cultural producer, and she holds an MFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art. In 2016, together with Soraida Lopez Diago, uh, she co-created Women Picturing Revolution, an organization dedicated to female photographers who have documented conflicts, crises, and revolutions. And um, they are working on a book that will be published in the spring of 2021. It's called Representation of Black Motherhood and Photography. And they, they recently got to uh, uh, speak about their, their project um, at Tate Modern in London, which is very exciting. So um, I will let uh, Leslie introduce Samantha. Leslie, you may take over. Thank you so much, Anya. It's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces. And I just want to thank you again for all of your effort creating this community. Um, it's been really wonderful to get to know so many people. And Samantha, I've been watching Samantha's work for many years. Um, and it's, it's beautiful to be here in this um, time with, with you all, so I appreciate it. Um, what I will do is I would like to do just a, an intro. I, I wrote something about four or five minutes about um, Samantha's work, bringing together two bodies of work um, that are quite substantial. And I incorporated some uh, ephemera from her studio. And I, we were thinking when we spoke earlier that that might be a nice uh, way for you all to, to experience the work. So thank you for being here. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, Samantha Box is Jamaican-born, Bronx-based photographer. Her documentary work, Invisible, focused on the New York community, commu sorry, New York community of homeless LGBTQ youth of color. The work is widely recognized, notably for a NIFA fellowship in 2010, a part of a permanent collection of the Open Side Society Foundation and FOCO and Lightwork. Her work stems from a deep knowledge of documentary practices, which paired with her thoughtful approach to story, storytelling has produced Invisible, a multi-chapter documentary project that holds the lives of queer, trans, and non-binary youth of New York City. Most recently, Box has embarked on a studio practice utilizing self-portraiture, sound, and installation to explore her intersecting diaspora, Caribbean histories, and identities. The work has been exhibited at the Houston Center of Photography and the Andrew Friedman House, and in the spring of 2021, Box will join the Bronx Museum of Art's AIM Fellowship Program. There we go. Box, Box has referred to Invisible as being about families lost and found, the need to create structure of family where people love you as you are. This work spans 10 years and documents the social issues affecting homeless, queer, trans, and non-binary youth of color and the structures of family, intimacy, and community that binds and protects. These images become a record, a love letter to the youth who welcome Samantha into their lives and record moments that range from grief to celebration. After 10 years of photographing for this project and five years of photographing the Kiki ballroom scene in New York City, Box felt burnt out as a creative. She was tired emotionally and no longer able to photograph someone else's story with the same rigor and urgency that she once was, once was possible. Mm -hmm. 
At this time, she began identifying and acknowledging the limitations of documentary photography. She began thinking about breaking down the structure in order to find newer ways to talk about the world around her. With this, she began her series, Caribbean Dreams. This is a studio view of her wall at home. On her studio wall, we see a reproduction of Michel Jean Casaubon painting, Sunlit Valley, Trinidad. This painting appears in her self-portraits, but larger and less beautifully reproduced, reproduced and often torn. Her use of light and form was inspired by Vanitas, a still life 17th century Dutch genre containing symbols of death or change as a reminder of the transience of life. Of life. These beautiful works of art reproduced on her studio wall often serve as both a visual inspiration and historical context as they're untangled, well aware of the white gaze from which they were first created. On her walls, we also see the Caribbean colonial past as picture postcards and these images reveal a brutal history of, quote, paradise. By placing herself in the frame with her hand in a, on a solid hold on the shutter release, Box reclaims and occupies a space that was once only available to the colonized subject who had no choice but to be displayed among the rewards of power. In this powerful gaze, she rewrites historical narratives to better reflect and present to better reflect the present moment. And finally, in her artist statement, Caribbean Dreams, Box asks, what is the nature of Exodus and the transformations that happened therein? These questions could also be asked of invisible. What is the language of transformation? The invisible youth are building a future where liberation exists in telling their own story, one of love that acknowledges the creative power of community, community and authorship. In her latest work, Box is also claiming a future imagination where she defines the visual language of her own multi-layered personal and ancestral narrative. Welcome, Samantha Box. Um, so uh, I just wanna say thank you uh, to Anya and to Leslie for um, having me here. Um, this, is, this really is a, a moment of um, a flex for all of us. And it's really sort of an honor to be able to, to present my work in this, in this particular way to all of you. And thank you all for joining us um, today, this afternoon. Basically, uh, so I'd like to go through um, um, the bodies of work which comprise Invisible, and then from that point, talk a little bit more about Caribbean dreams. So uh, in 2005, I started um, documenting New York City's community of at-risk youth of color. And I began by spending um, approximately 12 years um, working and documenting the lives that um, of the young people who um, were in residence at an emergency shelter for homeless, queer, trans, and non-binary youth in New York City called Silvio's Place. Um, this project was, um, and still is, I mean, I, I, I look at these pictures and I, I remember, I mean, anyway, it, it, was, it was a real sort of like, I spent a lot of time talking about uh, with, with everybody, uh, this, is, these, this is basically a family album in so many ways. Like I spent, um, and uh, people to who I'm still connected with. Um, when doing this work, I spent a lot of time thinking about like what it was I was doing and the story that I was telling, really trying to like refute um, at the time, like really horrific modes of representation for queer, trans and non-binary non -binary, non -binary, uh, young people or people or homeless people. And um, so it was, it was really, it was, um, an ex it was really sort of like me trying to, to um, tell the truth in um, the best way possible about what I saw around me, which was a group of people who had been um, uh, marginalized or sort of like moved to the edges of society, not, you know, based on a lot of like, government policy, um, a lot of like societal homophobia and transphobia, but they were here in the space and they were, um, um, the, they were resilient and they were trying to like find their ways through it all by connecting with each other and by making th these really strong family uh, bound, uh, bonds. Um, so uh, despite the fact that like you know, this picture talks about um, some of the family from which they were estranged, they 
essentially constructed their own family spaces um, that helped them to survive in, in the face of a society that often didn't want them to really sort of like do that. Um, I should say the shelter was like um, a really sort of like liminal space by itself. It was um, in the basement of this church and the space during the day doubled as a food pantry and at night it was the shelter space. And so, you know, like the, this kind of like a group of people who were sort of like at the edges of, of society, not at the edges of society, that's like the wrong sort of way of putting it, but like who had to find a, a carve out a space for themselves um, were doing so in a space that was sort of like temporary. And, um, uh, you know, it was really sort of like, I'm incredibly fortunate that I was allowed to spend so much time there. Um, as somebody who also sort of like my, I feel like in, in my sort of personal history, like there is a real sort of resonance in this, in where, what was going on for these young people and what was going on in my life as well. And um, so it was, it was really sort of like a way of being able to talk about this. Here is a young person who is uh, mourning her mother at her grave um, on Mother's Day actually. And we just spent a lot of time together, getting to know each other, supporting each other, um, advocating for each other in tough situations. Um, and they uh, really sort of like, you know, I, we became a part of each other's lives in a real way. Afterwards, I started working at the Hedrick Martin Institute. Um, I uh, teaching photography and that's where I got introduced to the Kiki ballroom scene. And so um, I started documenting the Kiki ballroom scene um, in, and um, as like sort of, you know, I, I, I went in there and I was, I was blown away in the same sort of way like that I was blown away by being in the shelter space. And what I mean by that is like completely blown, blown away and touched and moved by like the, the levels of like community empowerment the levels of like of um, self definition, the levels of like uh, cultural production, the levels of just like that sense of being in a complete family space um, with every single function, with every single um, interaction. Um, once again, I'm really incredibly fortunate that I was allowed to spend time um, in the Kiki scene. And actually I, I do hope to go back at some point um, having um, and um, documenting these spaces that the Kiki functions um, delineate, like which are spaces of like um, being visible, being seen, being recognized, spaces of community um, gathering, spaces where, um, you know, if only for sort of like brief moments, um, there, there is um, a real sort of like drawing in of energy of like people validating and seeing each other in a, um, including the photographer, including the photographer, the DJ, all of us, we all had roles and things to do within the space where we were like always like sort of looking and validating and um, um, helping each other to sort of like shine on, on uh, many different levels. It was a real privilege to witness this, these moments. And, you know, it's like, it's really like, you know, the young people who are in these pictures are the young people from who generate the culture of this country you know, queer youth of color are the ones who, who drive what um, youth culture is and like just, and um, that sort of acknowledgement, they've never really sort of up, up until recently, like received the acknowledgement that is their due about like their uh, amazing impact on what we consider, um, you know, uh, how we consider like, you know, like I guess like basic things about our lives, like our music, the way we dress, the way we talk about each other. Um, and it, so to also be like witness to, to this like amazing level of cultural production was just like, it was, it was mind blowing. And once again, I'm truly fortunate to, to have met the people who I met. Um, these young people are, are doing amazing, wonderful things, advocating for the communities, taking care of each other um, in a way that, um, especially like now, I mean, given the times that we're in, like it's like the, the lessons that I learned here are ones that I think that all of this, just about like sort of like community empowerment and advocacy um, are just essential uh, to all of us now. Um, so I went to graduate school um, and as Leslie mentioned before, like I was, part of it was because I was like, I was tired actually, um, not of doing the work, but just because I was like really sort of like facing a moment 
of reckoning where I was like, you know, like, am I the one to really sort of tell these stories? Like, is this something, um, maybe it's time for me to take a step back. There were many people who I was, was teaching when I was uh, um, teaching the young people um, who I thought were actually doing the work that I, they were doing the work. They, they were doing the work and they were sort of, and they were looking at their communities critically and lovingly. Um, and I felt like they should have had the voice more than me. And so I felt like I was taking up a lot of space um, and I um, decided, and also I was like kind of like questioning the idea of like what is documentary photography and who should be doing documentary work. Um, I was questioning the idea of like a, a narrative and thinking about like other ways like where, um, where how, how a picture could hold memory and how a picture could reckon with archive and how a picture could reckon with history. And so um, it seemed like a, I needed to sort of like shut down for a minute or to take a pause. And so, um, you know, and there was other things happening as well, you know, and so like everything sort of conspired or gelled together such that like I ended up um, in graduate school. I went to the ICP Bar Documentary, sorry, um, MFA program. And uh, there, you know, you know, graduate school is like really all encompassing and I didn't really have a lot of time to like get away from work in some ways. And so um, because I couldn't really go back and do the work that I was doing, and also because I'd given myself a pause, like I started thinking about other things as well. And so being asked to create still lives, I was drawn to things like Vanitas and also like the role of um, really being struck by the role of this like this um, black person who is in the background of some of these Vanitas, which depict like luxury objects with the kind of like underlying subtext of mortality, right? Um, but I was thinking to myself, like, you know, well, this person is also an object and thinking about like how these are sort of like the uh, products of colonization essentially in one image. I started thinking to myself, like, well, I want to reclaim that. Like, I want to, you know, re um, make this object person into a subject again. And okay. Um, also thinking about the ideas of like how the Caribbean, which is where I'm from, is like really sort of a constructed space. And then coming across like images of the early sort of like colonial, like this picture, for example, was from the 1800s, I believe, by the first uh, recognized Trinidadian painter. Thinking about the Caribbean as like a zone of hybridity and subversion of racial categories and creolization. And also the brutality of like of the legacy of sugarcane production, which is probably it's, you know, the history of both sides of my family. Um, both the Jamaican side and also the my mother's uh, indentured Indian heritage or descendants from. In fact, this is the factory that was in the town where she grew up in Trinidad. Uh, thinking about how uh, Caribbean bodies are commodified in the same way as the produce that comes from that space and exotified. Um, and then also thinking about like the um, theory that was put forth by Stuart Hall about like diaspora, about um, the ways in which people of diaspora like produce their own culture through the act of like remixing and, and uh, thinking about like claiming from, you know, claiming from the majority or the dominant narrative and remixing that into their own sort of spaces. So thinking about diaspora as a space of cultural production, is, I guess. And so this is actually my studio wall, which is here. And um, it shows sort of like the mishmash of everything that I'm thinking about right now. So out of this came Caribbean dreams. Um, and in this space, which actually most of it takes space uh, place in um, the studio, which is actually right behind me, which is my home. And I try to, um, what I'm trying to do is like use my, personal experience as a uh, Caribbean person who has been in this country for some time to question things like, or to reckon with things like memory in my family's history and my history. And also kind of like the idea of like, not necessarily sort of refuting the idea that sort of like immigrant idea of like neither here nor there, but actually kind of saying like, I am here, I'm in a diasporic space. With, that is within the Bronx and like claiming that as my own space that I can create. So much like the young people created um, their space within the shelter and much like the Kiki scene creates their amazing space within the ballroom scene. What I'm trying to do in this work is create a space for myself, which like I've never really sort of encountered where I can talk about, you know, um, my past, my present, what it is to be 
um, an immigrant, what it is to be like from two islands, what it is to be a black person who's also mixed race um, and, and things like that. So here there's actually a lot of like um, things like in these pictures, like I'm allowing myself the luxury of the symbolism that is in um, uh, paintings such as Vanitas paintings in some ways. So like the, that tablecloth is my father's mother's tablecloth. And this tin here is actually um, has a Christmas cake in it, which in the Caribbean every uh, year you get a fruit cake, and that's from my mom actually. Um, and then here's a reproduction of the Casabon painting, which appears in a lot of these, um, a lot of these images. And you know it's broken down, it's on like printed on really crappy paper, it's taped up, it's torn, but it's also like you know it's a way of kind of like. The, the poor state of this backdrop is a way of also talking about the way that the, the image of the Caribbean as a place of like paradise is actually just a false image, you know? Here, this is a, a, um, a still life that's based on uh, ackees and saltfish, which is the Jamaican national dish, which of course you can't ever really, you have to get it in this kind of like semi-processed form because ackees, like fresh ackees aren't allowed up here. And of course, saltfish is like the original long distance commodity, right? Um, you know, these products all come from my local green grocery. I live in a very um, diverse neighborhood in the Bronx. Um, and so on one hand, like I'm, I'm really fortunate to be able to like access like my, um, my own cultural leg, you know, like um, be a part of my culture, but it really only can happen at this remove, you know? Such that even things like Scotch bonnets are called hot Jamaican peppers. Like everything is renamed, you know? Also, this can is where the uh, title of the of this of this work comes from Caribbean dreams. I think it's hilarious. Anyway, so, uh, so early on, I started putting together like still lifes, um, keeping the packaging. Um, this light that you see is actually the light that's, that comes. It's the natural light of my apartment, more or less. But the idea that like these like um, putting putting uh, uh, exotic or you know fruit into this kind of like Dutch light. And so it was like, you know, um, underscoring the idea of like, of a vanitas in some ways, like these like sort of like exotic luxury goods put into this like light, uh, this Northern light, you know, keeping the packaging, keeping the labels was, is a way of sort of like pointing also at the fact that these things come from places. They're also transplants as I am a transplant, you know, and then taking the action of eating um, the, fruits and vegetables that are like in this like still life was like kind of like my way of reanimating or giving personhood back to that um, black person who was essentially objectified in early Vanitas images. So this work is, um, it's called Flashcards and it is um, based on the fact that like after being in this country for such a long time, I realized I'd forgotten um, names and of uh, different fruits and vegetables. And so, um, and so I started thinking about like the idea of what would happen if I went back to the Caribbean, would I be able to actually like feed myself really? And also like, you know, like even in talking to my mother, she was like, I haven't seen that in, in a decade. And I was like, wow, we're all forgetting. So, so it's this idea of a flashcard where I, where, um, you know, as a learning tool, you know, the tablecloth once again is my grandmother's tablecloth and obviously that's my hand. Um, the lettering is kind of like it's a play or I'm thinking about it as a play of like of uh, that font that people use for botanic lettering um, you know sort of like and um, but instead of like you know the species genus name thinking that like I'm labeling it as a, the names that my mom my mother taught me and so like kind of like insisting that or not kind of but I am insisting that these names are the actual names they're not you know and so like the names that were given by a colonizer are not the names that like are valid in some ways. Like the true names are the ones that we, the people who are from this space um, call, call these things. So, um, and then on top of it, I'll play this for a little bit so you can see. Edo. Tamarind. Tamarind. Sour orange. Sour orange. Moco plantain. Moco plantain. 
Sucre fig. Sucre fig. Pumpkin. Pumpkin. Shaddock. Shaddock. Scotch bonnet. Scotch bonnet. Julie mango. Julie mango. Christophine. Christophine. And that continues. It's, this is actually an evolving piece as I um, go to the store. In fact, I will go today and to see if there's more fruits and vegetables and I'm going to make flashcards out of them. My mom is an integral part. Um, I mean, there's the legacies of my grandmothers on both sides as well as my father, but my mom actually is a really integral part of this because um, she, that is her voice. And so the act of her, uh, one of my earliest memories is actually her doing flashcards with me when we were in Jamaica, uh, which is a whole other story right there. And so like, but like, but like that act of her telling me like, this is like, this is the name, you know, and even when we were doing it together, I was like, wow, you know, like she's, she's saying the, these words in a way that I could never really say them unless I was trying to be somebody else, you know, but all, it's just like that gulf between her experience with them and my experience with them. Uh, her experience with them um, having grown up, of course, in the Caribbean and my experience with them having grown up in America and, and how it really is sort of manifested in our accents. Um, yeah. Uh, she's really great to work with, actually. Uh, so in this picture here, this is my paternal grandmother some sugar cane, and I'm wearing um, a bracelet that my mother gave me that was her mother's. This is a, um, also sort of an evolving piece. Um, um, this, was a, this is actually a, a very small box, but over time, I think it's going to grow into something else. But basically, whenever I buy fruits and vegetables, I keep the packaging. And I think it's, you know, the, you know, um, and now actually what I'm doing is I'm also planting the seeds from these fruits and vegetables because I, I just find it, it's just like that, um, the idea that like, like the, um, like the fruits and vegetables, there's me, we're all sort of like this, these commodified forms, you know, and we're also just, you know, like, we're all immigrants, we're all transplanted, we're all like, we all have, are trying to, you know, and so I, I just find this to be, um, uh, something that talks about this, like what are the receipts of, of immigration in some ways. Uh, and then, you know, th here we have like my, the pictures are actually my dad's mother as well. And then, um, you know, just kind of like really sort of like riffing on like trying to collapse the past and the present um, into and also like, I guess like, you know, like here, America and there, the Caribbean into one space following Stuart Hall's idea of like a montage, you know, like this slicing and dicing of the space, um, um, you know, through indicators like the labels, my body, the jewelry, the rum, um, the backdrop. Um, this actually, this picture is supposed to, it, it was meant to function as a dictionary of the objects that are used in the still lives, but I, I think it just ended up being its own entity at some point. Again, there's that Christmas cake. Uh, this uh, vial actually has my hair, which I think of as a symbol of, um, well, it's not a symbol, it's like a direct sort of like um, uh, manifestation of like the histories of the people in the Caribbean who have contributed to, to, to me, to my heritage, right? And it's, um, you know, as somebody, it's, the the hair my hair my body um, my skin marks me as somebody who comes from that space and in the, as a Caribbean is a contested space I feel the same thing sort of like I use my body as a stand-in in some ways for the Caribbean as that um, and so like it's it's something that I've been actually practicing it's just like gathering my hair um, at some point in time I will probably make something out of it but like you know, but like that is sort of a symbol of my body in, in this picture. 
And of course, we see like these, uh, the pink plate and the keys and the background and everything else like that. Those are my grandmother's. And the uh, Fernandez Black Label Rum is only something you can get in Trinidad, as a matter of fact. It's not very good rum, but don't tell my mom I said that. Um, and then lastly here, this is my hair and uh, my grandmother's tablecloth again. This references, there's a lot of art historical reference as well in my images. Um, so this one actually represents, references a, an image by Zubaran. Um, I'm really interested in like that kind of like light and shadow of um, some of the Vanitas and also some of like those early sort of colonial paintings. Mm. And that's it. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, what an absolute treat and to, to hear you, you know, go through the work. Uh, this is a material question just because the, you know, I had been looking at Invisible for several years. Um, but then when I came across Caribbean Dreams, it was at the ICP, I believe it was your master's uh, MFA show. And the prints were quite large and they were printed. The materiality, the material elements of the paper became uh, really critical and I think um, as kind of um, part of the work, as the actual work. Can you speak about your installation choices, paper, and how you came to that? It felt very specific. Right, um, that's a really good question because that's something I'm also still actively thinking about, mm -hmm. um, about what is the proper medium for those um, prints. And so when I mounted the show at the ICP for my thesis, I made a deliberate decision to print it on paper that muted the colors mm -hmm. and also had, um, I mean, it was like very lovely paper, like a really sort of like, um, but it also kind of like looked, um, it was like kind of close to like as kind of like archivally newspaper. Like it, it, there, yes. there was like a, there was a point at which I was actually printing a lot of the stuff on newsprint. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I felt that, okay, for like my solo show, like I should put, like print it on like proper paper, but I wanted it to sort of like look like the muted colors that newsprint gives. Um, and the idea of that was to kind of like, you know, as Vanitas were, um, they had luxury objects collected in these paintings, but they themselves were also luxury goods. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, start thinking about what is the value of an image, you know, and, um, and especially since like there, there was that kind of, um, not a one-to-one -one connection, but like a very sort of, um, a strong visual link between a Vanitas and these, and the work that I was doing, I wanted to think about like, you know, well, this isn't a luxury item. This is not an object. Mm. Um, this could be destroyed, you know, like, right. is this ephemeral, you know? And, and in fact, like one thing that I still find really, I find myself like, there was also a period in which I was photocopying my pictures. And I was actually thinking about also doing that. Like maybe this should exist on photocopy paper. Uh, maybe this should actually disappear at some point. And so, uh, yeah, that's why I was thinking about that. In fact, like also like the, not to cut you off, but like the backdrop is um, there's something about that as well. Like the idea that here is like, you know, this painting that is, you know, sort of like this, um, you know, like the first, the first Caribbean, the first Trinidadian painter, but like this painting, uh, which was produced for people in Europe right. to experience right. the Caribbean. It's like, it's like sort of like also falling apart, you right. know? And I think that's really something to me, that's something. Mm, it's so interesting. It's such a beautiful, I love hearing when an artist, you know, takes the piece from full production into onto the wall in such a thoughtful way, because these could easily be printed as such beautiful, like precious, expensive objects, thus mimicking kind of what you're working against. So I love this idea of it having this ephemeral quality. It, it really is, is quite strong. And it was it left quite a big impression on me that that was your, your choice. Beautiful. Thank you for that answer. I have a question. Um, hi, Sam. Nice to see you. Um, so you spoke a little bit about um, capitalism and like the co this idea of like the commodification of objects. But I think more precisely, you pointed to this idea of like commodified bodies. Um, could you talk about and expand on that a bit more, please? Um, so Oh, so, okay, so like there's like the level of commodification of bodies, I guess related to this work, right? Like, so like there's, there's like the commodification of bodies and lives, like of course, like with legacies of indentured ship and slavery, right? Uh, but then, you know, just like also thinking about um, the way, so for example, like in England after World War II, 
there was a call, um, there was a labor shortage, right? And so the English or the, you know, the government was like, put out a call to its empire for people to come and to work in England, right? And so that was the Windrush era, you know? And um, of which Stuart Hall is a member. And, you know, my family came from Jamaica, not obviously like to England, but to America, because like there was also a similar thing of like, come and work for us, come and take care of us, right? Only to kind of like have a lot of the same conversations that we're having right now around immigration sort of like be leveled at them. You know, like it's like in that sort of space of like racism and uh, xenophobia that were, you know, that's where like Stuart Hall starts getting his ideas of diaspora. And just like thinking about how it's like, you know, people who, you know, like look like me, look like you, like, you know, have been sort of like shipped around the globe at, you know, like literally like fruit and well, which sounds like really horrible, but, but kind of like as commodities, right? Like our labor is a commodity. What we produce is a commodity, like our culture is a commodity. And like, you know, really, you know, I've been really thinking about that a lot, like as, um, you know, especially like as like, interestingly, as I've been also um, trying to make plants, these fruits sprout in this light up here, that like where it's like not supposed to grow, like I'm not supposed to be reproducing things in this space, like I'm not supposed mm -hmm. to be in this space, you know what I'm saying, right? And so like, I've been thinking about all of these things about um, the transplant who shouldn't be transplanted or what mm -hmm. has a transplant grow in a place where it's not supposed to grow, you know? And so, yeah. Mm. Thanks, Martez. Thank you. You're welcome. How are your plants growing? Let's see them. Oh, I wish I could show them to you, um, but they're because they're all over there. So, um, so the banana plant's not doing well. I don't know why. Uh, but like, it's growing two little pups, like two little suckers, and like those are going well. And then, actually, what's really cool is that my dad gave me, um, and let's say I think we were talking about this before. My dad gave me a um, some cuttings from mm -hmm. a plant from a hibiscus bush that was in my mom's mother's house in Trinidad and which was smuggled over obviously pre 9-11 you know like where you know you could smuggle a piece of stick in in your luggage right and so he gave me a couple of these cuttings which are now actually I don't know if you can see the those plastic bags that's what those are so those mm -hmm. are cuttings from like a 25 year old hibiscus tree like to, sort of like in some way I think about it as like the the fig trees that Italian immigrants brought over um from in on in their voyage and like now it's i have this like a clone of my grandmother essentially or of her house mm. like in my yeah that's cool so also my passion fruits are are kind of sprouting too which is nice so beautiful i mean i hope you'll make a piece out of those plants it sounds like you are thinking about that transplantation process and thinking about your um it, as an extension of the work that you've already done and um it's I think it's a really rich, interesting medium to be working with and thinking about which of those plants can thrive and documenting their growth. And I'm really curious about what you'll make out of them. So, and hi, Sam. Hi. It's good to see you. I mean, what I've been doing recently is like over the quarantine period is um, because of course, like, um, you know, fruits and vegetables really do cost a lot of money. And so like, I was like, I need to save my resources and stuff. But I have been using um, the plants as, as, um, as a way to um, build sort of like jungle, not, not a jungle, but like kind of something like that, you know, and, um, and um, especially with, uh, I don't know if like in the slideshow that I showed, there was a, that picture of the young Indian girl. I've been thinking about um, constructing studio spaces to, to question those photographic images, mm -hmm. which are part and parcel of like the legacy of colonialism and the intersection of colonialism and um, photography, mm -hmm. but kind of like, you know, so I've been constructing gardens with my transplanted plants and then also kind of like using that to play out scenarios that allow me to question the history of pictures like that. And so hopefully they, they'll work out, um, yeah. Samantha, fun. can I ask you a question about your workflow? This is something that my students often are interested in. The photo that um, we used for your class uh, is one of my favorites. I feel like it really looks like a painting. And um, I'm just wondering, do you 
sketch it out first? Do you really know beforehand where everything goes or do you improvise on the table and you have all the materials collected and then you place them? Is that a secret or can you talk about that? Um, it's, it's not a secret. So like I um, have, I also did this when I was doing um, documentary work too. It's like I would actually kind of sketch out ideas, um, particularly with the Kiki scene. Like when I was, when I was, uh, you know, um, um, actively documenting the functions, I would think to myself like, whoa, like it would be so great if I could get a picture that looked like this, right? And like, um, I don't think I ever got a picture that looked like this, but it was just like a way of like thinking about the world of like kind of saying like, all right, if I see this, like that's what's gonna happen. Like, you know what I mean? Keep an eye out for these things, right? And so I do the same thing with um, the studio work um, where like I'll have an idea and I'll kind of sketch it out and I can't draw. And so it looks like nothing, right? Like it looks like a, just a mishmash, but it's like this kind of thing of like, okay, well, you know, I want, to, I want my picture to be composed more or less like this and I want my body to do this. You know, and it's usually triggered by something like, you know, I'll read something or I'll like see something and I'm like, oh, this, this is how I want this picture to sort of look like. So I'll sketch it out and then I'll uh, set it up and then I'll look at the setup, especially through the camera, everything changes, right? And so since it's like a four by five, everything changes entirely. And so then I'll say like, All right, I got to move this around. So I'll, I spend like hours, like just like shifting things around and, um, and then I've already kind of like made like a shot list based on that. Like, oh, I think I should, I should be like this for like this, the first one. I should do this. I should do this. And then, of course, the act of doing those things, I'll come up with other ideas, right? Um, interestingly, it's like, it's like a four-hour process to set up a picture and 20 minutes to actually take the picture, which is like, you know, um, it's That's just like, how I don't, it, goes. it totally is how it goes. Yeah. But I, but I sketch and then there's a process of actually making it, which makes the picture really happen. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. I just wanted to mention that we've got people here from Mexico City, Caracas, Washington DC, Greenwich, Connecticut, Uptown, Washington Heights, Harlem, Beacon, and Oakland, California. And if anybody else wants to write in and let us know where you're sitting, please do. And also we got a question from somebody in the chat um, and she is saying, a few years ago I visited Puerto Rico and read Esmeralda Santiago's when I was Puerto Rican. And she touches on the idea of transplantation and how one goes back to the place you're from after growing in the new land. And with that in mind, do you travel back to Jamaica and Trinidad and do you ever feel that feeling or deal with it in your work? Um, so I haven't been, interestingly, like I've only been back to Jamaica a couple of times, considering that's like where I was born. Um, but my mom's family, because it's mostly because like my dad's family was mostly out here. And so we would just go to the Bronx, actually. And like, so uh, if we wanted to see them. So, but my mom's family for a very long time uh, was still in, and still is still in Trinidad. And so I have a past little cousins down there and um, an extended family. So, uh, and I haven't been back in a very long time for a variety of reasons. Like it's, you know, like just life, I guess, you know, and, but I, but I would like to, I do actually recently, I've been really feeling the, um, like the need to go back to uh, Trinidad um, and also to Jamaica, you know, but definitely to kind of like to Trinidad because like that is sort of like where I feel like a lot of like my ideas of what the Caribbean, my lived experience with the Caribbean happened in that space, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, uh, so I would like to go back. My mother actually has been going back more and I want to go back at first with her because, um, I mean, one, it would be easier, but like, but like two, like, I think just like kind of like seeing things through her perspective, I think would be um, really instrumental. It would be sort of like, and I think she, she would like to show me things and I would like to ask her questions about her life. And so, but yes, at some point, um, that feeling that you're referencing is something that I, I've been thinking about a lot. I just wanted to note the performative nature of your work. And I'm curious if performance art or any um, any special interests of artists there from your past, your, your photo education, 
uh, and the performative nature of how I imagine the planted seeds, which again is such a powerful idea. And I think, um, I think we're all want to see, you know, where that, where that goes, but you, your interest in performance art, does that exist? I mean, using your body, can you speak about that a bit? Sure. Um, I'd just say like one of the things about, if you had asked this question maybe about three years ago, I probably would have said like, no, right? right. Like I was a photographer and like, that was it. But being in graduate school and also just like, um, you know, where, um, you know, my amazing uh, professors such as Joanna, you know, and, you know, but, and Nayland as well, and Nayland Blake, who's the chair of the program, like, you know, really sort of encourage this idea of like, you know, you're not just like limited by photography, you're not just limited in the way that, um, to one sort of like way of expressing yourself. And I think that, you know, the first time somebody actually did say that I should film myself as I'm making, as I'm doing this work, I was like, no, I'm not, I don't want to do that, you know, and being, taking self portraits was enough of a jump to think about performance was too much of a jump. But now I'm thinking actually that it does need to happen that maybe I think video work might end up being sort of like a logical step of, um, of, uh, making this work mm -hmm. but yes and so and of course it's like I, I have um I have been getting interested in performance because it's it's really um like what is performance art like who who is doing it in a way that is that resonates with me um there is a group of uh, uh, uh two sisters out of Puerto Rico uh Las Nietas de Nono and I really encourage everyone to look at their work it is spectacular I saw it at the Whitney and um and i was like blown away it's it was performance work that talked about um uh black women's experience in puerto rico mm -hmm. police brutality gynecological violence and the restorative nature of indigenous and traditional knowledge mm. and it was remarkable and so like thinking about like that level of performance like now i'm like oh, this is this is what i can aspire to so mm. yeah. superb does i'd like to oh, ask question Annie. yes Hi, um, I really appreciate your work very much. It's uh, visually and thematically and culturally, it's very visually striking, but um, very thoughtful. And I fear that you show different work from documentary to more studio work, but I fear that identity is your kind of going through all your projects, uh, whether it's someone else's life or your life. And you mentioned that your transplant nor here nor there. <laughs> so can you talk about, it's a big word, I think, identity. Where, uh, how do you see yourself? Where do you find as your home? Do you think about this often or it's more like, you know, you acknowledge your place, yourself, so you, um, you're comfortable with where you are. We're, yeah. we're seeing other person's life through the documentary work. So can you talk about this? I think it's just... So one of the reasons, I mean, like, you know, so I'm, I'm a queer black woman, right? And so like, and so and when I started, especially like the homeless youth work, like I wasn't much older than a lot of the, the young people who I was photographing. And so that's in why in, in some, in many uh, ways, um, and also like, you know, like there was a sort of like real sense of like my life as being like, you know, really at the end of the day, like not that dissimilar, you know, but so like, you know, it, we were sort of like looking at each other. I feel like we were, we were maybe like looking at each other as like, there was a lot of common ground between um, me and the young people um, in the shelter. And then like, you know, I'm, I'm still very much a queer person. And so it's like, you know, like in, in the Kiki scene. And so like, I'm bringing that also like this kind of like multi-dimensional sense of identity, you know, throughout all the bodies of work, right? And I think that what also connects it, so like, so, so I am kind of like talking about identity, but it's like, it's, um, you know, I'm not looking at another person's identity from necessarily um, entirely the outside. Does that make sense, you know? And so like, so it's like I'm exploring, you know? Um, and I think there's also like that, the idea of like making you know, where, where is home, I think is like something that like does go through all of the parts of my work from the documentary work to now. And, but also like there's a, the answer to that, which is like in, inherent in the question of where is home, I think my work also answers that too. It's like home is, 
home is here, like home is around your community, home is around the spaces that you create culturally, like, you know, your cultural production spaces, like the people that you're creating culture and family and, and life with that hold you together that, um, you know, thinking about, um, especially um, in, in the Kiki ballroom scene and the mainstream ballroom scene altogether, like there are amazing like historians of the scene who, you know, and people who call back all the time to the ancestors, mm -hmm. like, you know, who call back to like, you know, the people, the elders of the scene. And so like that kind of like, really sort of like deep cultural space, you know, of like deep cultural creation, I think, you know, happens like, you know, in, you know, it happens in all the spaces, you know, like when, when I put on my grandmother's tablecloth or I'm standing in front of those pictures, like I'm calling back as well, you know? Um, in some ways, like I don't see like the documentary work as being sort of like a separate entity from the self-portraiture work because yeah. of those kind of common themes, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like always a calling back to back to the people who are home for you and to the history that is home, I guess. Mm. I'm taking so many notes. <laughs> Samantha, <laughs> thank you. That actually might be a really beautiful place to pause, the idea of calling back the history of home. I like looking, you know, very much ending conversations, um, looking to the future. And you mentioned the idea, and I'm, I'm looking at my notes here, of the diaspora as a space of cultural production, right? This idea of deep cultural creation, um, which you mentioned the cultural production of the Kiki ballroom scene. Um, so you've meant, you call this body of work invisible and all of these um, sections of it an archive. Can you speak to that, how you, I know that's a big, big question, but <laughs> I know that you're focused on your current work, Caribbean Dreams, but how do you imagine the future iterations of collaboration with the youth who are now adults, right, in this archive project? Where does that live? Who will have access to it? Or is that something you've thought about already or enough to kind of announce? I mean, it's, it's definitely in, in a thought um, phase, but what, what I would like to do is basically to, to take, um, to, to have that work um, as an archive for the community um, there's a lot, I mean, just so, for example, like, um, I guess, like, thinking about, like, the homeless youth work, there are people in, in those pictures, and we're in, like, the wider sort of, like, collection of images that are no longer with us, you mm -hmm. know, the spaces are maybe not there anymore. Um, just even things like people's birthdays, you know, and just, like, there, so there's a lot, you know, in, in the homeless youth work that needs to be sort of, like, um, I think people need to definitely have access to. And, the, and also the same thing, you know, in, in thinking about like the amazing and deep history of the Kiki Ballroom scene, like yes. there, I think there needs to be, um, what I would, my contribution, I think, should be that, um, you know, I have, there's a lot of work that I have that I need to go through that I need to edit, but like, I would like people to be able to kind of like access this work and say like, well, you know, do you remember this person or do you remember like this particular function or do you remember when I won this award, right? Mm -hmm. And to be able to kind of like go through all of this work, like, you know, by keywords, by people's names, things like that. And so it's, it's kind of like this like living database of the, of like, uh, you know, an extensive period of time, you mm. know? And, um, you know, and I want it to be sort of like free and open to the, to the community. Like this is, I feel like that, that is the thing that I can do. Like I'm, I think that the community should be documented, especially the Kiki ballroom scene, especially the ballroom scene. I think the ballroom scene should be like the people, there are such talented photographers, videographers, sound people who are an archivist and academic. Yes. And, like, and so I, I feel like that, like, uh, you know, like maybe like I'm adjacent, but I feel it's like people who are not adjacent, like should be doing that real document and getting the credit for the documentation and getting the credit for that work. And so mm. I feel like the best thing I can do is like maybe sometimes like take a step back or, you know, and then kind of say like, and here is use my work for this thing. So mm. that's what I've been, that's what I've really been thinking about. That so, the best people to tell the stories are the people who are, you know, walking and part of a house and actually making the cultural, yes, the culture itself, you know. It's, it's a really uh, fantastic next iteration. I'm hoping that you find, I mean, that's some, some project that I think, you know, it's always hard to find the time, the means, the, the funding, but I, I really see a lot of potential there for support for a work like that. It's, it's, um, it's a beautiful kind of uh, next chapter for the project. 
seems feels good. Yeah, I I would like for it to be something that. Yeah, for it's you know because I mean especially with the you just like always think it's like this work was never it was always for the community like it yeah. was always you know and so I really want it to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an invaluable record. I think we'll look back in twenty thirty years. And these are the pictures I really believe that we will be looking at and talking about of this time that you've created. So oh, thank you. So thank you. Um, thanks again. And I hope to see you uh, at um, future talks. We will do another one, as I mentioned earlier, in about a month.